Pokemon is all about catching them all. Well, I mean, it was until recently. Anyways, I was just curious to how little you could explore in a game like Pokemon. I looked at Pokemon Emerald and wondered if it would be possible to go from receiving your starter to becoming the champion without catching a single Pokemon. The first obstacle that comes to mind is what to do about the 8 gems that are required to traverse through the Hoenn region. A fun fact about the 8 8 gems in this region is that only 5 of them are required, with 3 of them being water-based moves that made sense to pick Mudkip since he can also learn the other 2 required that are Strength and Rock Smash. I'm not really allowing much leeway on the catching Pokemon thing. If it's a Legendary, that's free XP, and if it's shiny, you gotta kill it and that's just heartbreaking. Our precious little Mudkip may leave a lot to be desired when it comes to his stats. The reason for this is that no rational human human being would pick this set of stats over these, but that's where I come in and say, oh boy, I love an arbitrary challenge with an odd set of win conditions. The heart of this challenge really stems from asking, could I instead of should I? and that's how we ended up here. Upon being gifted my Pikachu by Professor Birch, I immediately went into the grass and started grinding. I beat my rival, talked to my dad who focuses on work instead of me, watched Wally learn what a Pokemon was, and then I made it to Petalburg Woods. Nothing interesting really happens here since it's just the path towards the rock gym and let this serve as a reminder that I picked the water type Pokemon. Inside the gym, our little Pikachu had his first attempt at evolution, only to be denied by a single press of the B button. It really makes you wonder if being blue balls in the middle of your metamorphosis Orphus's hurts, but I mean, it'll get used to it since there's a whole lot of this down the road. The easiest solution to this is to get Neverstone, but that's boring. I'm just cheating. It's just this arbitrary rule I just made up. Anyways, Roxanne lost my already overleveled Mudkip. We retrieved an old man's lost dog and then set sail on the haha -ha boat. We then arrived in this granite cave and a mysterious hiker offers us Flash. We then walked off, looked at him over our shoulder and said, wow, thanks for nothing. The hard part about caves in this run is that you don't have Flash, which means you can't see and you have to walk through the caves by memory alone. Lucky for me, I played this game hundreds of times as a dumb stupid kid at the dumb stupid after school program in third grade because my real life dad didn't have time for me. We then find Steven who gives us the first useless piece of information for a Mudkip only user, which means it's now time to fight the second gym leader. I try to fight every trainer I could in the building, but it wasn't enough for this underdeveloped Mudkip. So naturally, I resorted to bullying kids on the beach until that magically became enough to earn another gym badge. After that, we fought Team Aqua, beat our rival again somehow, like I really don't know how I did this one, and then approached Mauville City, which held potentially the hardest part of this entire run the electric gym leader. The balance of this in the Hoenn region is that if you're going the water type, your marsh Nom should already be half ground type by now, thus being immune to electric moves. Sadly, that is not how this story goes. You really just have to allow your Pokemon to pop as many pills as you can before you inevitably run out of money. Don't do drugs, kids. Your best bet is using Mud Slap, a move with low power that lowers your opponent's accuracy, but they only use Shockwave, which has a 101% accuracy, so it's just like, Shit! I'd like to say that I eventually won this battle through sheer willpower alone, but I'll be honest and say that the AI just messed up and hit me with the Howl instead of Shockwave, which falls under one of the most we take those kinds of wins I've ever seen, but we take those. This gym badge allows us to use Rock Smash, which is an actual move we will actually use. You can then use Rock Smash to get strength, and this is an actual move that we will even actually use. At this point, you're starting to figure out that the Mudkip we carry is going to be void of an actual move set since we have to use all these HMs to navigate through Hoenn. You can go to the move deleter, sure, but to get through Victory Road, you need Strength, Waterfall, Surf, and Rock Smash, and we're lucky Dive isn't required, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. On our way to some story-related missions, we walk through the Fiery Cave, and there really isn't anything of interest over here except TM06 Toxic hiding behind a boulder, but we'll get to that later. After that, we run into Team Magma, go through a forest, and then fight the fourth gym leader who specializes in fire, which again, let me remind you that I chose the water Pokemon. Upon receiving the fourth gym badge, our journey puts us in a beeline towards the fifth one. I definitely thought that this was going to be the gatekeeper for me. Norman's Pokemon had all the tools to absolutely steamroll me, and at this point, I guess I just severely underestimated the growth of my Mudkip. And then Norman sent out slacking. I was worried about being sat on in a hilarious fashion by this humongous beast, but then I remembered slacking's ability. He can't attack every other turn, and my Mudkip was faster and new dig. After denying Schrodinger's Marshomp another chance to breathe, we took the HM Surf, got a Thunderstone for our dearest Pikachu, and then progressed towards the Weather Tower. Inside, Team Aqua bombards you with the exact same shit you've seen before and ultimately fails to overpower the strongest Mudkip in existence. You would think that the Weather employees would be grateful for you saving their lives, and that's the problem. They are. 
too grateful, if you ask me. They offered to give you a reward for your troubles while stripping you of an option to decline. With that being said, we retrieve our second Pokemon of the playthrough, and just like that, the run is dead. I mean, we never caught a Pokemon, I suppose. It's not like I used a Pokeball for it. I suppose that I could just hide him in the box like a red-headed stepchild and hope he never sees the light of day. So with an additional skeleton in our closet, Steven Stone shows us another fun piece of useless information before we go into the sixth gym. I'll be honest and say that these puzzles for toddlers took me a bit longer than I'd like to admit, but I eventually found my way through. I debated on teaching my Mudkip Rock Tomb for this gym alone, but I trusted my precious child to eliminate- oh my god, they're all dead. Remember when I talked about Team Aqua earlier? Yeah, just imagine that that again, but this time with ghosts. Then imagine that again, but with Team Magma, and now rocks are around. The twist here is you have to fight the leader of Team Magma, and during this fight, I kind of ran out of PP, so I thought using Dig against his camera would be a fine answer, but I was wrong. We got him on the run back though, so let's just focus on the positive, okay? Our next objective was to return to Slateport, and since my Mudkip could not learn fly, no matter how many times I asked or how hard he tried, so we had to walk across the country again. This is just a pointless objective that activates the next event in Lily Cove, which is a painful process if you don't have the ability of fast travel. And since we were in Slateport, I thought we would surf over to the abandoned ship and pick up TM-13 Ice Beam, and we're just gonna put that in the bag until later. While returning to Slateport, I ran into a random encounter. Upon slaying another tentacool, somebody asked me to fix a stream layout. As I was attempting to please a loyal viewer, I realized that I made a grave error. It's just a, it's just a lighting error. It's a white balance thing. It's like, I can just slide one thing on here and make it work. Like, wait, that's saturation. That's wrong. Uh, wait, wait. Yeah, so I turned the game off and went back to my last save, groaned loudly, and did it all over again. Backtracking through time was as painful as it sounds, and then I picked up Toxic along the way, defeated Team Aqua again while picking up a Master Ball that is essentially worthless, and then we found our way back to Moss Deep. This gem served as a huge roadblock in our path because this gem clearly incentivizes double battles with its design and theme and gem leaders being Tate and Liza. Or Liza, or Lisa, ah, who cares. As soon as you make it to the gem leader room, they turn you away if you only have one Pokemon. To battle them, I have to catch another Pokemon, which would absolutely disqualify me from this challenge. But what if we had a certain albino metamorphosis love child to bring back out of hiding? Surely this doesn't count as catching a Pokemon, and it's not like its inclusion really matters since he's just gonna die to Zatu's psychic. From this point on, Mudkip easily won the 2v1 by spamming Surf the entire battle, and upon leaving the gym, I went out to go do what I felt was right and release Cast Form into the wild. But they refused. Back in the box he went, and we went to assist Mr. Stone in a double battle. He was kind enough to allow me to choose any Pokemon I wanted, so I chose my Mudkip and we washed the floor with these lackeys. With our journey soon coming to a close, Steven finally did something of value and allowed me to teach my Mudkip a brand new HM, Dive! With this being our fourth one, Mudkip looks no different than the HM Zigzagoon slave at this point, and nevertheless, we continued our journey to the eighth gym. But before I did that, I was surfing and ran into a shiny Tinnacool, laughed hysterically, and killed it in front of everybody. But I still forgot we had to go to the Aqua hideout, so yeah, we did that too. Then returning to Pseudopolis. They play a nice little cutscene while Wallace plays 20 questions about Rayquaza, interrogating me about their location as if a 10-year-old with a mudkip had even heard of whatever that thing is. For whatever plot convenience reason, we trekked up to meet Sly for the Sky Dragon and he instant transmission to somewhere random, I think. Since I didn't want to attempt to imitate it by walking painfully slow, I just battled in the Sky Tower until my little mudkip couldn't handle it anymore. Since whiting out just sent you to the last Pokemon Center you went to, it activated the next cutscene immediately. Rayquaza interrupts this fight that looks like a stare down to tell Grant out on that he got insanely counterpicked. I mean, he has this tiny piece of land and Kyogre has this ocean on their side. He then threw in the white flag, which caused Kyogre to dive back into the ocean, and I don't really know where Groudon went, honestly. Anyways, after seeing all three of those monsters, this allows our protagonist to enter the final gym and succeed in these puzzles that I definitely remember being much harder as a kid. Juan doesn't really serve as too much of a challenge for the beast that was created before your very eyes, but I thought it would be a very funny flex to throw a Master Ball at his truly beloved. He didn't appreciate the joke very much, and to be fair, I get it, it's not really that funny. So with all eight gym badges in hand, our journey now directs us at Evergrande City, which is honestly just one building. 
and nice. But first, we have to go to the move deleter and ditch dive and learn waterfall. Luckily, only four of the five required HMs are necessary to get through Victory Road, and if that wasn't true, the run would have just ended right here. Upon entering Victory Road, we are greeted with Wally trying to strike a pose, saying we can just fast forward through all this. He never really served as much of a challenge to the superior species of Pokemon. Victory Road is a dark and scary labyrinth, and I wasn't really about to rely on muscle memory nor flash, so I just looked up a guide and counted step by step. Nothing really exciting happens here, so we can just fast forward to the Elite Four. I stocked up on last minute supplies and sold my revive, since we can't possibly use those. I called this a practice run since the moveset I was going on was full of low PP HMs, with one of them being Rock Smash, which is a hilariously awful move. This definitely sounded much harder on paper, but Mudkip kind of tore through all of the first few trainers. We got to Drake with only water moves that are not very effective, Rock Smash is just not, and we didn't have any ice moves. Things seemed kind of hopeless. I decided to use an Aether on Strength, and that turned out to be the saving grace here somehow. Upon beating the Elite Four, we had one remaining challenge in our way. This Mudkip has been through so much. We all have in this adventure. And with our journey finally coming to- Okay, we got Toxic stalled by Wallace's Melotic and Loss. Okay, whatever. At this point, I just decided that our moveset was not going to cut it. One of our moves did not even get used in the Elite Four, and the rest didn't cover what we needed it to. With Toxic and Ice Beam still in my bag, I wanted to equip them to Mudkip, but- how? We made our way back through Victory Road, picking up a much-needed PP up on the way, and arrived at the move deleter's house. After removing half of their HMs and giving Mudkip as close to a real moveset as I possibly could, we set out to see and died. You know, since this would warp our trainer back to the Elite Four, and the HMs required to get through Victory Road were no longer applicable, this time was going to be different. Each move was strategically picked for each trainer. A lot of Pokemon were die to surf alone given stab bonus, but we also had strengths to cover the matchups with weak defense or who were strong to water. With everything in place, Mudkip was unchained, storming through trainer after trainer. okay, and then Glalie just used self-destruct. This time for sure, after arriving at Phoebe's battle, I realized the last battle her Desclop exerts pressure, which is bad for my limited move pool. I also noticed that he opens with protect and would keep spamming it until one connected. Being that he could use this move 10 times, I decided that I would just buff Mudkip up as much as possible, and then on the 11th turn, the beefiest Mudkip you've ever seen slaughtered all of the ghosts. I used a similar strategy for the next trainer, since Mudkip lived in constant fear of being exploded on by a living snowball. When it came to Drake, the difficulty of the last run went away, since Ice Beam was the perfect tool to destroy everything he loves. Which finally brought us back to Wallace. I took my time and beefed up against his Waylord, which I feel like if that Pokemon ever gets Dynamax, stadiums are going to collapse. With Ludicolo knowing Giga Drain, this could serve as a huge problem. Being that I had a heal each time he used it, I just waited until he used the move five times and then Ice Beamed him down. Wallace's Tentacruel is by far the least threatening Pokemon he has, so this was just time to heal, buff up, file my checkbook, and mentally prepare myself for what was coming next. Melotta came out using Toxic, educating me that I've never said most of these Pokemon names out loud, and little did they know, I could be Toxic too. This this fight went on for multiple minutes, but Mudkip eventually found himself a victory somehow. Surprisingly, this wasn't the end, but after using Ice Beam, Wishcatch was frozen, and at this point it was just hard of the cards from there. With Wallace attempting to hold the throne and not lose to a 10 year old, he threw out Gyarados, but you already know how that went. So just like that, Mudkip single-handedly became the champion of Hoenn's Elite Four. It was a long journey, but his very fitting lonely nature led him to victory. A lot of people said that a Mudkip couldn't accomplish such a daunting task, but let this be a lesson to you. No matter how large the obstacle may be, if you believe in yourself, you can accomplish anything if you have a drugged up fish with legs by your side. One thing that I thought was funny during the credits is that they really want to walk you down memory lane by showing you all the Pokemon you caught, and, uh... <coughs> so thanks for watching, this was definitely one of the more fun videos to make. It takes a bit longer to create than typical gameplay videos, but I'm down to make more if you guys want them, so let me know in the comments of any other arbitrary challenge you can think of, and be sure to follow Nova for doing all the animations, and be sure to like and subscribe while you're here. And, I don't know if you know this about me, but I've always been bad at making outros, especially when reading from a script, so...